middle school or all ninth and 12th grade students who attend traditional and transformation high schools. Families may decide whether to participate in in-person learning or to remain in virtual learning. For charter and contact schools and contract schools, please visit your school's page to see plans for in-person learning. We will launch this effort in three phases. Kindergarten through second grade begins Tuesday, February 16th. Grades three through five begin Monday, March 1st. Ninth grade and 12th grade students start Monday, March 1st. Our rationale is clear for this for three reasons. Uh, first, as I spoke um, Tuesday night at our board meeting, we know there are groups of young people who desperately need support they can only receive in person. The second, we have growing numbers of our families who want this in-person option. And third, we've proven we can do this safely and we continue to increase our mitigation efforts and will continue those efforts um, throughout the remainder of the school year. So, I know you have questions and we can get started now. Please. of our ninth graders um, are now receiving um, at least one failing course. The reason why this is a particular flag for ninth grade is we know from decades of research, most recently from University of Chicago Consortium, that the ninth grade year in high school is a critical predictor of post-secondary success and whether a student will successfully graduate from high school. So even with some of our changes to grading policies, even with um, some of the interventions that we, um, and I would just say teachers, principals, have already instituted, we have seen um, close to a 20, over a 20% increase um, in the numbers of students. I think for, for ninth grade, it's, it's closer to 30% increase in the number of students um, in ninth grade who fall in that category. And for us, what that means is that this is not just impact for this year's ninth graders, it's impact uh, for the next four years for these young people's careers. So when we're looking at that data, we're taking that into account, um, and we are looking at kind of the long-term needs and the increases that we are seeing this year as compared to other years. And frankly, what we're hearing from young people themselves. Um, I have talked to students um, who have said, um, I need to be back in school. I need some, some time in school. I need, I, virtual is not working for us. So we are certainly not saying that there are not some young people who are doing fine or even thriving in this environment, but the data is telling us that we need another option for families and students. Sure, so where we are right now with regards to teachers is one, clearly we are targeting teachers first in the grades um, that, you know, in which we'll be reopening. Um, teachers will absolutely have the option to apply for leave. We are, uh, we are following the guidance of the CDC, so those teachers with underlying conditions as defined by the CDC, we have two levels of groupings. Those teachers will certainly be able to apply for leave. As I noted earlier, um, we will continue to have virtual options for families. So clearly we will still need teachers um, in the virtual environment. And we will, begin, we will make that announcement and make that available uh, through our Q&A um, session, as well as all teachers who will receive notification beginning tomorrow 
on how they can apply uh, for that, that extended leave for those purposes. Are there contingencies in the event that you have a shortfall when it comes to the teachers you need in person in the class? No, it's a great question. And one of the things that we have learned from colleagues across the country um, and even some of our colleagues here, um, right here in Maryland, that this is a contingency that we do need to prepare for. We've seen some of this even in uh, the in-person learning we have been doing since, um, since this summer, um, that we need to make sure we have uh, reserve uh, faculty who can come in and help um, in instances, right, where we, people might not be able to come in person. Uh, so our human capital office has been working the last, I would say, couple of months to make sure that we're shoring up um, our, our substitute pool, shoring up uh, which staff um, across the district actually can serve um, in a teaching capacity. And I would say we have the benefit um, of actually having increased numbers of schools um, who are providing us guidance um, with how we can actually um, do this and, and maintain staffing. But staffing is absolutely a challenge, if for no other reasons, just in terms of quarantine protocol. And we're also hopeful that as we continue um, to increase our symptomatic testing, we'll be uh, very intensely working on increasing our asymptomatic testing. And as I know all of you know, um, given the um, arrival of, va of vaccinations, we're also hoping that will help mitigate some of that. But in the event um, for that in-between time that we have staffing challenges, uh, we actually really have been ramping up, um, knowing that that, that that will probably be the case. Yes, Liz. Um, Sure, sure, sure. Well, well, I will say this. Um, I have been in constant communication uh, with Mayor Scott and um, with our health commissioner, uh, Dr. Zaraza, who I can't say enough um, just how blessed we are in Baltimore City to have the health commissioner we have. Uh, the mayor completely understands that this is a challenging situation he, like myself, we've had conversations like every day, you know, when I come in to North Avenue, I see young people on my way in, out, right? They are not in virtual learning. They are out in the neighborhoods. Um, he sees that as well. And I think he recognizes um, that this is a challenge, challenging situation. We want people to be safe. It's why we have done um, this kind of opening. Um, step over step. We've done it slow and steady. We have learned from what we've done over the summer. And so I think there has been verification for that. Uh, Dr. Salmon um, has been, has begun work with not only myself, but other superintendents across the state to uh, begin uh, putting, uh, assisting us in, in putting the protocols, getting the information together um, about vaccinations. I will also say that um, just the, the support that has been given by our local institutions, I cannot say enough about. I mean, University of Maryland Medical System, uh, we were one of the first LEAs to be able to have the kind of testing we now have in place. And it's because of, you know, people like Chuck Tilton, uh, Ch Chuck Tilden and Dr. Callahan, who prioritized this. We're talking with partners now um, about how to ramp up, and that's, that's local partners, frankly, as well as national partners, about how to ramp up our asymptomatic testing. So, you know, the one thing that has rung true throughout this is that our partners, our elected officials, again, Mayor Scott has been incredibly successful, um, excuse me, incredibly supportive um, of us, uh, even in the early days of his administration. Um, but Mayor Young was as well. So I do think that there is an understanding that this is a community effort. 
to successfully educate young people, to do it in a way that we keep our educators safe, our young people safe, and actually offer robust options for all of our families really is a goal that I think, you know, most of our partners um, and leaders understand. So, you know, I would say that, that, that I, I have felt supported by key people and, you know, a lot of it is, quite frankly, the board has been supportive. The board has asked hard questions. Our board of commissioners has, I think, very much uh, pushed in critical areas that have made us better and smarter about how we are doing this. Um, they too understand that this is not a situation any of us want to be in, but to ignore the impact on student learning and to ignore that we do have families who want an in-person option um, really would be irresponsible. But, and so. No, absolutely, and you know we're hoping that with charting this path, um, that we will see um, some of that same tangible on the ground support with vaccines. Um, but I will say, I, I, you know, we're not pursuing just one path. We're also working with local health partners. Um, we're we're working with our local health department for that prioritization. Um, and again, we have had health leaders in the city who are helping to leverage access um, to the vaccine and are helping to leverage access to some of those protocols. Yes, you know, I would love a call um, tomorrow saying, great, we're going to prioritize to get you, uh, you know, more vaccine or more asymptomatic testing, and that, that would be great. But, you know, I also know the announcement was just made. And so it does help um, speeding up the prioritization of education staff. Um, to be able to receive the vaccine. Uh, one of the things Dr. Salmon asked about um, and asked all superintendents was about prioritization, right? Who would we prioritize? And we have, and you know, I want to emphasize, we have had school staff who have been in buildings um, since March. And so, you know, we've had discussions, I've had discussions where I've said, I think those staff need to be prioritized. Those are people who have been out working. We've had teachers um, in buildings since July. Those folks should be prioritized. We also know people that are going to be working on the front lines and have been need to be prioritized. So I do think that there is a recognition that there is an intimate relationship with mitigation factors and the ability to open schools safely. And to your point, I think there is a growing national recognition that if we truly want schools open safely, if we truly want educators to feel safe, we are going to have to make the investment in seeing that that can happen. Right, so we know, so for example, when I've had conversations about this, um, you know, one of the heartening things is people have said, who are the folks, you know, how many people do you need vaccinated? So I can say 10,000 employees, and for some partners, they have not blinked when I've said that. Um, when we have had, um, when we look at teachers, and teachers were calling back, what we'll do is we'll look and see, you know, how many families actually want to come back. And as I've said before, you know, I'm not anticipating, you know, we know the community that we serve. And so we know that there is rightly a wait and see because of systematic and historical experiences with both educational institutions and medical and health institutions. And so, you know, we've seen that all along. When we first opened our student learning centers, we only probably had about three or 400 Families, is that right, Allison? We only had about three or four hundred families out of a thousand spots 
who initially took advantage of those seats. What we saw over time was as we were able to demonstrate that we could safely bring people back, when families saw the hand sanitizer was there, the six foot distancing was there, when we began, right, actually putting those things in place, when they saw that PPE, that kids were keeping masks on, when they saw that air purifiers, right, were where we said they would be, we went from 400 to all 1,000 spaces being filled. So we know that this is going to be gradual. We know that clearly we're communicating our prioritization for those folks who are in the front line. Um, and then as that vaccine becomes available, what we've heard now is that we just need to make sure we have the processes in place to be able to distribute. But we are not pursuing a singular avenue for either testing, asymptomatic testing, or vaccines. That, that I can tell you. I have not just been sitting and waiting for somebody to call me to tell me it's your turn. I mean, we have, my team has been proactive. We have been having national conversations, conversations locally with partners, because, you know, I met with a group of teachers two weeks ago who said to me, if we can, for example, deliver significant asymptomatic testing on a regular basis, like many colleges and universities are, have done, that they will feel more comfortable returning. So we have been working on that. Well, but sorry. I'm sorry? I, I don't want to say now and trigger anything. I, 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 but, but I will say we're look part of why, um, you know, we are looking for this month runway is to give ourselves the opportunity um, to see that manifest. But I, I, but I have to tell you, like the University of Maryland medical system has been absolutely fabulous. Um, we told them our families are not going to go and, you know, from wherever they are in Baltimore, you know, with questionable transportation, they're not gonna make it to the Civic Center. They worked with us around our family's needs to stand up mobile testing that takes place at school sites for, for, for symptomatic, um, you know, for symptomatic cases. And so now we're working on what could that infrastructure do to help further asymptomatic testing? And what could that infrastructure do to help further uh, vaccination. So we absolutely are in those conversations and what I'd continue to say, you know, once those partners release me, but, but I will tell you what has been encouraging is the national interest in Baltimore doing this as well as our local partners. And that for me is what is most encouraging. That's a great question. We are looking at combinations of both clearly prioritizing teachers um, first, but also actually um, asymptomatic testing for students as well. Um, I will say that, you know, for example, my sister is a college professor and it, the, the asymptomatic testing worked to help keep them open, right, without lots of spread. So we've been looking at that. But I think the other piece we have to keep in mind that we have been emphasizing is we have been doing this since the summer and it has been slow and steady. We did not rush into this, and we are building on the success that we have had as a, as a system. So when principals, we had 27 schools that opened in November, and those school leaders have been our greatest source of feedback. Those school leaders have demonstrated how it can be done safely and the, the overwhelming majority, with the exception of one case in one of our food sites, the old, the, every other case has been a case that is not connected to in-school transmission. It is part of community spread. And, and it, so that's why we work very closely with Dr. Zaraza, who, like I said, as far as I'm concerned, she's the only health commissioner I would want right now in the city of Baltimore. She has been amazing. She is a former pediatrician. She understands child development. She understands this community. She understands health inequities. And she understands schools. So they have been reviewed. She has been reviewing 
our health protocols, our health advisory group, made up with professionals from Morgan, Johns Hopkins, University of Maryland, they have not gone away. And so this is about slow and steady, continuing those mitigation factors that have been in place and have yielded the results that we've had. And yes, it, it is, it is challenging. And I know people are scared. This is a scary time. And when I spoke to teachers, I had a small group of probably about 15 teachers, some of our teacher leaders across the city, some of whom have been in person since November, and some of whom have not. And, and their fear is real. And it is justified. But that is why we built up the trajectory of success that we did before we made this announcement. We made sure that we had things in place. Those principals will tell you if something was missing, if something did not arrive on time, they received priority. Our operations team under the direction of Dr. Lynette Washington has done fabulous work. We charted this opening in the number of classrooms and grade levels based on the number of air purifiers because she and her team knew a teacher should be able to walk in a classroom and if there is not quality ventilation, see an air purifier there. Her team has been tracking that. So this is not some off the hip, oh, maybe we'll open schools tomorrow. We've been planning, we've been working, we've been learning and we've been learning from the people on the ground doing the work. So when I spoke with those teachers on Monday and I said, if, you know, if you're one of the ones that has to go back, what would you need to see in place? They gave incredibly strong feedback. It's one of the reasons why you'll notice we're doing half days the week before teachers come back because it is a shift and we want them to be able to go in their classrooms before children arrive to be able to flag anything that might be amiss so they can flag what about this what about that so they have the opportunity to dialogue with colleagues who actually have been out doing this successfully this is not about forcing people unprepared back into school that's not what this is and like I said I know the community we serve I am not expecting 80% of students back on February 16th because we have to demonstrate that we can do this. But what families have said who have come back is when I saw that it was in place, I felt good leaving my child. And for families who I talk to who aren't so sure, they say the same thing. Well, I want to be sure, right? And, and I am not, you know, we're, we're not tone deaf to that. The same question the Board of Commissioners has been asking. This board is a great board, not because they just say yes, but because of the way that they push. And they have pushed. Because they hear from the community as much, if not more, than I do. And so, again, we have taken this slow and steady. We have watched the data. We continue to work with health professionals. I continue to advocate nationally and locally for this city because these children are why I do this work. And I believe that families in Baltimore City deserve an option. I know families that have immune compromised children. Of course they are not sending their kids back and I would never ask them to do that. But for families who want a choice, they deserve a safe choice. That's what this is about. Sorry, I don't know if that was the answer to your question. It was, uh, it, it's interesting. Okay. Just about how often are you seeing students with symptomatic content, and how does it work? How do you know when students have symptoms? Yeah. So a lot of the asymptomatic testing we have not launched yet. That's the work that, that we're doing over the next couple of weeks and we've been exploring. The symptomatic testing, has, uh, has really gotten off to a great start. That is a combination, and it, you probably, I should probably ask the Chief of Staff, Allison Perkins Cohen, to describe that, because it's really been um, her leadership and her team's leadership. Um, there's no way I have the time 
to get into the detail she has, but it really is a combination of, um, again, University of Maryland medical system who has worked with us so that tests can occur at school sites. So if a child or a faculty member has a symptom, um, instead of us having to wait two weeks, right, for, uh, for them to figure out whether they can get to testing or not, we can actually do the testing on site at the school and then a van with University of Maryland Medical Center professionals actually comes and gets the test. So the burden is not on families to have to go out and find the test. We're actually bringing the testing um, to families and what that does is it shortens the time um, that we have to, you know, for example, wait to, to figure out whether someone actually has COVID or not. So we don't, um, we haven't currently begun the asymptomatic testing. Uh, what I was really referring to is it, that infrastructure already in place allows us to really um, think through how to ramp up now asymptomatic testing as well. Please. Okay. Thank you, Andre. So those teachers who do not have an underlying condition have the option of taking unpaid leave. They have a variety of other options um, that can be seen on our website. And you know, as part of the regular human capital processes, and they're the same processes that have been in place uh, for a while. So we will see, but I, but I will tell you that the overwhelming number of teachers I speak with, it is about information, it is about knowing and seeing, it is about being verified that what we said would be in place will be in place. And when it's not, because we do have over 10,000 employees, <laughs> right, and close to 170 schools, it is a question about when something is flagged, are we addressing that concern? Which is why, again, we're bringing, we're giving teachers who will be returning half days the week prior to any students that are returning so that they have time to be comfortable. When I went out in November when we opened um, more, uh, more extensively then, um, you know, I talked to a teacher who was back in her classroom with her students with disabilities and she was incredibly honest, young African-American teacher, and she was incredibly honest. And I said, so how are you feeling? And she's like, I gotta tell you, I, I am really nervous. And I said, okay, talk to me. What do you need, right, to help you not be nervous? And she had her air purifier. You know, I asked her about students in masking. She said, no, all the kids are, she said, no, the, the kids are masked. She had her aides with her. And, but what she shared was incredibly human. She said, it's just new. She said, and it just kind of, and I don't know whether she said wild or weird, but it was clear that just being back, and it reminded me of when I, back in March, went to a supermarket for the first time with a mask, and I wondered, am I gonna be able to keep this on? What is it going to be like? And I think that's normal and human. But she stayed, she was fine. I've had some of those teachers that I visited that week who I asked for feedback, have given feedback. You know, that's what we're trying to do. This, this is a community effort. And so we're not brushing those off. Some of the best suggestions about scheduling have come from teachers who are actually either trying to think it through or those who are in classrooms now who've been doing it. And one of the things that I saw in, in a meeting that I had on Monday with teachers, as I referenced earlier, half of whom were in, actually in teaching and half who had not, had not gone in at all, was that the exchange and the dialogue between those two groups, you could begin to feel some of the questions being answered in ways that as a CEO, it's gonna come, it's gonna come across differently. They wanted, their colleagues who were actually in the field doing the work 
to share how it was going and what made it work. And so part of the work we're doing with our principals is, you know, what are some of the ways to facilitate it? And the 27, and it wasn't just principals. Like we've had, we had resident principals who supervised student learning centers. And they learned a whole lot about procedures, about, you know, how do you do outdoor time better? How do you take better advantage um, of the outside? We have lots of learning here in Baltimore City about how to do this. So again, this is not some haphazard, slap it together decision. It's based on a slow and steady. We didn't just randomly open everything in September. And let's be clear, you know, I've wanted kids back for a while. But it, it was listening to the ground, and it was making sure we could do it well. And it was understanding the families we serve. I know that the overwhelming majority, I'm sure, and I've said this, the overwhelming majority of our families, for good reason, will still select virtual when we begin mid-February. But what I have also seen is that when we do it well, when we can prove that we can do it, families return. Yes, here in Baltimore City, they do. And if they don't, let me tell you, we hear about it. You know, and I got an earful from teachers, some teachers on Monday on, well, we think you should do it this way, that way, this way. That's, like I said, that was the result of teacher feedback that that half day came back. That, that was teacher feedback that, that instituted that because, you know, they were talking about how are we going to get ready? We teach all day. We're already exhausted. We're already maxed out. And now you want us to just magically? And I said, you're right. And, you know, if I had my ideal, one thing I would recommend to the state is that they give districts that want to open that are larger school districts, you need to give us waivers for some of those school days for teacher prep. I'm working around it and we're doing half days. But I think the acknowledgement that this is a heavy lift for people. I'm not brushing off those concerns. I'm not brushing them off. That's why, we ha that's why we've gone beyond CDC guidelines. That's right. So, mm -hmm. um, is, are you convinced that the virtual uh, experience is going to be as good as the teachers also that in person are? So one of the things, again, that we've learned, that, that we have learned from other school districts across the country, right, and I am incredibly blessed to be part of Council of Great City Schools and Chiefs for Change and those organizations. So I've talked to other superintendents who flagged this for me early. And so part of what we focused on when we opened our 27 schools was how do we give schools models and options for what this can look like. So one of the, um, you know, one of the elements, I think, of, of good news connected with the additional CARES funding um, that is coming is that it will enable us to provide some, some more on-the-ground support for schools and balancing that, so that's one, right? So one of the things we learned from, we heard, again, I got an earful um, from our, some of our 27 principals was, you know, you, you need actually more human support to help manage this new world. So what we've said, you know, um, even with our amazingly um, frugal chief financial officer, Chris Doherty, <laughs> right, is what we have said is we're going to devote some of our care funding to making sure that there is at least some, it may not be ideal, but at least some of that on the ground support because school leaders said that was absolutely necessary. I think the second piece, um, and this is another suggestion that came from a teacher and came from what we learned in November, was providing different models for what this can look like. There's no one way um, to do, you know, the virtual and the in-person that works for every school because of the difference in staffing. 
because of the difference in um, grade distribution. So if you are a school that only has one class per grade level, that's going to look very different than a school where you have three or four classes that are very different. Um, some schools have figured out, again, this is the beauty of doing it slow and steady, is that some schools have figured out um, different ways with, in terms of cameras within classes to be able to do virtual and um, in person simultaneous. Some of the people, some of the teachers I talk to who've done it say it can be done, it's exhausting, but let me tell you, these three things really would make my life easier. So that's been a lot of the listening. Those are the groups um, that I myself have been sitting in on. You know, I haven't just, it hasn't just been staff because I want to hear. I want to hear what people on the ground are saying, are their biggest challenges, and it's reflected in the plan that you see posted. A lot of that feedback is reflected in the plan you see posted, and it came from real folks on the ground either planning to do this work or already doing the work. Because I believe the answers are here. As much as I love our national, you know, connections and all of that, we, got a, we have a lot of smart people here, and they have figured out what actually is needed. And so that's what we're doing. Please. With that in mind, if a president-elect happens to offer you an opportunity, do you feel com comfortable that the plan that's in place now for Baltimore City Schools would survive you well? And has that been part of your consideration? Um, you mean if the president-elect calls me because he's got tons of vaccines that he wants to drop in Baltimore City? Or if he has a job he might want to offer. Oh, you know, uh-uh. Like, I, I have said from the beginning, I continue to say, um, your colleague Liz Bowie has asked me this on numbers of occasions. Your colleague Tim Tootin has asked this on numerous occasions. I am focused on Baltimore City. I am focused here. And because of that focus, by the way, it's why we have some of the things we have in place now. I'm not, I, I'm really clear, focused on Baltimore City. But I will say to President-elect Biden, if you have an extra 50,000 vaccines you want to drop, uh, we, are, we are more than happy um, to receive that. So if you've got, if you, if you find yourself in a conversation, you can pass that along to our President-elect. Any other questions? Great. Thank you all. Much appreciated. Thank you, Dr. King. Um, everybody, on Thursday, January 21st, 